fearless fundraisers. I'm Dawn Lego. It's time to buckle up for a new episode of Raise Nation, the one and only podcast made to inspire fundraisers like you to continue making impact in our communities, building better tomorrows, and exchanging ideas. So whether you're a trailblazer or seasoned pro, you'll pick up the trends that transform your fundraising. And together, we'll dive into lively conversations and chat with industry-leading fundraisers and thought leaders to explore hot button issues and innovative ideas. So stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we inspire you to embrace the future of fundraising. So let's get going. I am super excited to introduce my co-host, uh, the auctioneer extraordinaire, as I like to call him. Uh, please welcome, uh, give a warm welcome to Ben Farrell. Hey, Ben, good morning. How are you doing today? Oh, good morning, Don. I, of course, am doing fantastic, gearing up, ready for Rays, and most definitely ready for Rays Nation Radio and all the great conversations that we're going to have. How are you today? I am fantastic. I couldn't be more excited than launching Raise Nation Radio with you. And um, I think we're ready to introduce our guest and just get started. How does that sound, Ben? Oh, it sounds absolutely fantastic because we could not be having a better guest here today to talk about all things fundraising, not just in the local market, but all across the country, uh, bringing two decades of experience, everybody. Deb has led a diverse, multi-affiliate national fundraising, revenue-generating initiatives for worthy charitable causes all across the nation, including, of course, MDMA, March of Dimes, and her current role as Chief Development Officer at Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America. America. What, uh, what an incredible wealth of information she brings. Her focus, of course, is activating data responsive, donor centric nonprofit teams. And that's what we're going to talk about today to really cultivate those individual donor relationships. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome the one and only Deb Barge. Deb, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Don. Thrilled to be with you today. So well, great to jump have you. Oh, sorry, Ben. Go ahead. No, oh, I'm just oh, totally all right. Uh, so excited that you're with us. Of course, we have seen you at Raise in years past, sharing on uh, great panel discussions and really bringing so much to our listening audience. So I feel like we should just jump right in. Right now, how are things with your current role dealing? We'll just jump right in, of course, with COVID out there. How are you keeping those teams moving confidently with so much unknown out there across the nation? Great question, Ben. <laughs> if if nothing else, I feel like all of us across the team have realized change is our new normal. We have to be ready for change at all times. And as we approach fall and we continue to change those plans we thought we had set, we now get to adapt and evolve. And we've become so we've we've flexed our muscles in a way that we've become so much more capable of that quote unquote pivot in real time. So we might have planned to go live this September with a few events, but because we knew what to expect thanks to the last 18 months, we have backup plans already in place. Unlike when we started this back in March of 2020, this was more predicted. We had a, a reason to plan ahead and think about what would it mean if we had less humans with us in person? What, it, what would it mean if we had to go remote right away on an event? And how do we maybe plan for no events at all this fall? And what's that look like going through the rest of the year, still not planning for those alive moments? How are we getting creative? So what we have done, I think, is be more prepared and continue to be resourceful. And we want to make sure that every one of our communities continues that ability to be flexible with what's going on right in front of them. No two communities are experiencing COVID in the same way. And you could be within 90 miles of each other and have a very different experience. So we really want to make sure our agencies have all that insight and flexibility, but more important, that collaboration together to talk about what are you doing and how are you doing this? And it's probably the best part of being part of a network is you get peers across the nation to talk to in real time and hear about their real innovations they're addressing. And then you get to do what we all do in nonprofit. We get to uh, rinse, repeat, and personalize for ourselves. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. I've heard that a lot lately. It has taken on a whole new meeting. Um, let me ask you, Deb, but with all the change um, and constant change, I think we thought it was, you know, maybe going to be a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Who knew it was going to be, what are we, 19 months now? How do you, how do your donors respond 
to that change? And how do you keep them engaged for such a long period of time? Like what? That's just, it's a little crazy. So what's your response to that? This is a great question. And you are spot on. I remember, I, I'm in the Seattle area. So I remember last end of February, where we had the first case in the US, and we were already shutting down before others across the nation and telling folks, oh, just wait, just wait a few minutes. You'll see, we're, we're all going to hit this in a minute. But we all thought, oh, by June, we'll be back going normal, right? And what we did right that moment is no different then as it is now, and that is we communicated with those humans. And those humans that were both individual donors, but also represented the corporations and foundations that support us. We have to remember that what happened, happened to everyone. The joy of COVID, boy, it was pretty um, inclusive. We all got to experience this lockdown. And while some of us, especially those from underserved communities were hit harder, we in the nonprofit space, we all experienced it at the same time. We were all hit equitably in having to adapt. What may not be equitable is in how our donors came to rise alongside of us and what, where they saw our need. I feel like those of us who communicated with our donors in an authentic and meaningful way, how do we need you today to support our mission through the pandemic? We created loyalty with those donors. And for some, some that might have been event attendee, but not friend yet, right? I, I might have been a transactional donor. I now get to have a relationship with them. And in a way that I never could have before. What, what I keep saying, and I, I talk about a lot, is COVID between the nonprofit and the donor has created some new equity for for me as the fundraiser to join you in your house or in what might be your second or third house where you're vacation homing and, and I am not. And to see your cat walk across the table or to see your children behind you in real time. Or if you're my corporate partner, I could see you're working from home too and struggling with your children on homeschooling or online schooling at the same time. And it all of a sudden humanized our work in a meaningful way. We, we got to have a conversation first of, how are you doing today? How is your experience going? And I feel like that communication is what brought our donors closer to us and keeps them closer to us now. And it's what's going to keep them closer as we get through year end and start to look at the sun rising in 2022 and moving into some new normal. Well, Deb, you are really singing the, the song that I've been hearing um, all across the country. And it's truly so special right now for people to hear what you're saying, that you during this time of COVID have built bridges of understanding and stronger connections to the donors and had the ability and opportunity to transform someone from a transactional donor to a transformational, someone who is now a friend of the organization. And it all comes back to communication. So your earlier answer, we, you know, you said the word that I said I would never say again, but for the purpose of this recording, I will use the word pivot because pivot is something we had to do in the spring of 2020. But with the experience we've had now with the event, the success of online fundraising um, and all the other revenue streams that were created, now we are planning, no longer pivoting, we are planning. And you said you are planning maybe for an in-person, maybe for online, or maybe even depending on the market, a combination of the two. So I think for everyone listening, everyone seems to struggle with what's the best way to communicate. And of course, multi-channel communication is out there, but for you and your organization, you obviously mentioned you were having Zoom communication with some donors, but what did you find the most effective, effective excuse me, communication tool you used uh, moving into this fall fundraising season? Yeah, great question, Ben. And candidly, it's changing. So it it does a little depend on the donor. I always think it's really important to treat every every contact like a human, and then we all have a different experience. And what I am finding today is that that is breaking through is the telephone, this magic thing, where I could get off Whoa. screen. What's right? that? Well, wait a minute. What's that, folks? <laughs> brand new. You turn your video off. You might put your headphones on. And you may invite a donor to just join you with a phone call. And by inviting them to join you for a phone call, what you do is give them a screen break, which they much need, especially if they are also a working individual or a home uh, parent who is homeschooling their child or other reasons. That moment off screen is a gift. And all of a sudden, you get to just have conversation. You get to listen. You, you get to thoughtfully 
ask questions and you get to thoughtfully allow them the time to answer and give them that reprieve, which is kind of a joy. So as you all think about it from even right now, the folks that are listening today, we predict many of them will be out for a walk, right? Taking a screen break and listening along or maybe gratefully driving in their car somewhere (laughs) and getting to listen along. And your donor is no different. So I am finding that that beautiful phone call is really breaking through in a way that before, do you remember avoiding all those phone calls and your voicemail would pile up? And now you're kind of excited to get a real phone call that you're planning for. Well, we all need those Zoom breaks, right? (laughs) We're just looking for, um, it's just a new way of working, right? We're all looking for that. Zoom break, Starbucks run, walk with the dog, do a little laundry. And I love, love, love what you said that we're not in it alone. What we're going through, donors are going through, um, your, the, your corporate sponsors and your partners are going, we're all, we're all, we're really all in this together. And I love your positivity that's come out of that, looking at this glass half half full instead of half empty and, you know, turning transactional donors into loyal donors is just huge. And so that, you know, that's just super, super, super special. Well, you know, it's funny. We hear a lot of talk about the screen time and someone said, you know, I've been, we, we had a successful online event last year. We're just not so sure if people have had too much screen time. I said, well, we've been watching TV in America since the fifties. No one's got tired of looking at that screen. So maybe it's what we're putting on the screen that needs to be the, uh, that needs to be the improved product. I don't, I don't know, but um, so I have a question for you because obviously picking up the phone, having a personal contact is just, is just key. So for people, People who may be uh, with a small organization or, of course, a lot of charities joining us here at Raise. Some of them may even be a one person army out there just kind of going it alone or a small team. What is a way they can maybe prioritize or if they don't have time to make the individual calls? What are some of the other communication tools that you are sending out to provide stability in such an unstable environment? That's a great question, Ben. And candidly, phone call doesn't work for every demographic, right? So as Don was saying, we've all spent time on screens, or as you shared, TV's been around a long time. We love to watch. (laughs) Well, think about our younger demographic who started their lives with a small little device in their hand that they could watch everything all the time. They don't really understand a rerun because those Mm -hmm. don't exist anymore. And they have everything with them. So That group actually doesn't mind a great text message or a messenger conversation, which many are using the Facebook Messenger with great success or Facebook groups with great success. So I think it's really important that that multi-channel comes alive based on the demographic of your donor. Email is not dead. We are still using email and it is still working. And what is really important is that those communications, if they are not one-to-one, if they are one-to-many or one-to-several, they have some sort of mission impact. Let's not forget why you have the privilege of their contact information. You have the privilege of their contact information because they care about your cause. And at some point, they gave you that permission to connect with them. So make sure your connection brings that mission right back to the center. And whatever your mission is, for us at Big Brothers Big Sisters, it's the little. The little is in the center of all we do. So when we communicate, Everything starts with a story of a little, an opportunity to talk about a little or why littles need us today. And it's really important for your mission that you always bring that to the center of why we're, why we're dialoguing, why we're engaging you through whichever channel you give us permission to. And in that one to many, it's probably what makes you stand out more than anything else. It pulls at that heartstring that makes us all engage with nonprofit and philanthropy in the first place. Well, you're the mission, of course, of uh, Big Brothers, uh, <clears throat> Big Sisters, Bigs and Littles. I love the stories I've heard over the years. And and really what maybe not everyone is not as familiar may not know just how long some of these relationships can last. So obviously, what have you done? We um, Charities are driven by great volunteerism, people uh, showing up for you. So during COVID and beyond, um, how have you been communicating, keeping those volunteers showing up, signing up and being? there for you. Um, Has that had to change or have they simply transitioned to an online environment like so many others have? Oh, so many changes, Ben, in the Mm -hmm. mentorship experience for the bigs and the littles at Big Brothers Big Sisters. 
for Big Brothers Big Sisters across the United States, we are one of the largest workplace mentoring programs in the nation. So you may not know that littles are coming to workplaces and spending time side by side with people and learning, having access to career experiences and seeing what could be their possibilities. Well, all of a sudden, workplace shut down. So then what happens? We are invited, thanks to those partners, into their virtual experience. And now several of our programs are operating where Bigs and Littles only met on screen, have only experienced that over the past year. But guess what? You can still feel that connection between them. You can still see the engagement happening. And in that more community-based program that we offer, that one-to-one, it was an evolution. And in many of our agencies, they have been piloting programs that are what we call technology-enhanced mentoring that are bringing onto their phone or device an app to help them engage in real time, to provide a little more mental and social-emotional learning resource in the hands of the little and the big to coach through some of the challenges we've all experienced this year. And then let's not forget school-based programs. We are also a large school-based program and we have had to adapt. And in some schools that has meant staying alongside the virtual experience. And in others, it has meant pause because our teachers and our administrators have been working to figure out how to engage youth. And I think that's what's so amazing about Big Brothers Big Sisters is our priority is to continue to serve young people. And if that means we need to adapt and mold, we will. In some agencies, they became also a food provider when school might've been providing lunch or breakfast. Where you might trust to go now is your Big Brothers Big Sisters agency. And so we were able to step in in many areas of that collective impact model across the nation and provide resource, provide connection, and continue to be that key partner in our little experience, but also for our big. It's it's nice to see my daughter actually is um, part of a high school program where she's a big to, you know, to a little. And, you know, we had the wonderful opportunity to continue on virtually as opposed to, you know, hitting pause. And it's just nice to see everybody just wanting to keep programming going and keep the little as a cent, you know, the center of everything that you do. So I'm so just glad to see that happened here locally where I live. And um, it goes from, you know, local to national. And, you know, that round trip is is beautiful to see. But you did mention something about um, the workplace being, you know, such an, a, an important um, opportunity for, you know, for what you do, where littles go to, go to the workplace and get that mentorship. And now that it's moved to virtual Um, Did you see um, any changes in the corporate collaboration, almost like out of sight, out of mind while they're there virtually now? How did that change or what did you need to do to keep that going really strong as well to not lose those um, collaborations and support? Don, that's a great question. And first, I need to celebrate your your youth being a mentor to other youth. That is the joy of Big Brothers Big Sisters is we all need a mentor. Each of us that sit in this conversation today had a mentor that coached us along. And that is you're keeping my um, streak alive as well since I've been here. I have not been in a group conversation where someone wasn't a big or little, had an immediate family member that was a big or little or a board member in one of our agencies. So thank you for keeping that streak alive. Of Let's course. move to that workplace part of the conversation. What, what I have to praise is our staff who act as a resource to that big and little for every pair. They are guided along in this experience, but guess who had to be real savvy to know how to use Teams and Zoom and uh, whatever portal that workplace wanted to use? to engage their team. And then we had to adapt in and join them in that forum. We also had to adapt curriculum. So maybe our curriculum before was interview skills and resume building. And we used to break out into small groups in person or at tables. How do you now do that in a meaningful way technologically and engage? And what I have been able to sit in on a few of these experiences with some of our agencies and watch as small groups happen and bigs and littles are breaking out. And this one was happened to be about public speaking. And you got to go through a whole conversation about how do you feel when you public speak? Let's practice. What does it feel like in small group? Now let's go to the big group and share our experiences. And I felt like the authenticity was so clear. And in that same way, we talked about the donor 
equity coming alive. I could see on screen the equity between the big and little, the the home environment coming alive. The you know me a little because we've talked about the struggles we've been both experiencing this past year together. So while the workplace part of uh, seeing the physicality of your workplace might have changed, I actually think it introduced for littles how adaptable workplaces can be, how inclusive those workplaces can be, and how very quick and innovative workplaces can be, which for our next generation of employees, isn't that a great thing for them to learn young? Excellent. Uh, outstanding. Sure. Life skills came out of this, right? That being adaptive, be keep moving forward, right? That fantastic. I, I just love your perspective on things. It's, it's a lesson for all of us to learn. So that's just incredible. I'd love to ask you about your, your upcoming RAISE um, experience and speaking at the annual RAISE conference. RAISE is celebrating its five-year anniversary and you have a couple of sessions go- going on. Do you want to tell us, give us a little sneak peek, tell us a little flavor about what you'll, what messages you'll be delivering to the nonprofit community? Absolutely. And thrilled to be back at RAISE. I have had the privilege of speaking a few times. I have been the nominator for several fundraiser of the year. So very proud to see people on my team have won that many times and really excited to join again an event panel talking about the evolution and what does the future of events look like with a a respected peer in the industry, Dennis Satir, who for many years led, I would say, one of the leading nationwide gala programs that there is at JDRF and has just a wealth of experience. And then also with our partner at Winspire talking about what they're seeing in trend. But the session I'm really excited about is really rooted around Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And that is our work to integrate social justice into our fundraising partnerships and how we bring who we are to life. So many companies talk about DE&I, meaning diversity, equity, and inclusion. What many don't realize is that Big Brothers Big Sisters was founded as an innovative alternative to the juvenile justice system. We were created literally to create equity and empowerment for young people by bringing diverse communities together to create an environment that is inclusive for all and invites those youth into real opportunity for their future to thrive. With that spirit, we celebrate JEDI justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And over many years, not just through the pandemic, but for the 100 plus years we've existed, that is rooted in all of our programming and always has been. What has been amazing about Big Brothers Big Sisters, and I credit all of those who sat in my seat before me, is that for many years, we've brought that social justice lens into our partnerships, bringing key corporations and entities to our side who believe in that and are authentically our partners in the work and supporting the programmatic initiatives we lead under the Jedi umbrella as part of their social justice commitment. So they didn't enter 2020 not having a partner. They were already alongside us. They were already invested in the work. And now authentically more and more folks are coming to the table. That's amazing. It is amazing and inspiring. And uh, when we look at the world, the way it's shaping, I think that we can all take a moment right here listening to be grateful that you've got these programs in place, that you've been successful as many years as you have, and you are bringing along the corporation to show them the way, because it is one by one at a time that we're going to improve this world. So on behalf of everyone listening, I know they're fired up as I am right now. I'd like to extend a thank you to you, Deb, and and all of those amazing programs. Um, That's really fantastic to hear. And as someone mentioned to me, they said, you know, we have been teaching this very practice to our young people through our programs, which is you do not let your circumstances define you, that you're, you can define your own circumstances to your in response to the environment you're in. And so this has been our great opportunity, right, uh, in COVID to, to change and shape and adapt. And so with that, I bring up the, the famous Einstein quote, which is uh, imagination is better than knowledge, right? Knowledge tells us the way, what it is, the way things are, but imagination allows us to see things as they can be. So as we get close to 
wrapping up today's conversation. Everyone tuning in here at Raise Nason Radio wants to improve their fundraising, improve their team. So all of with all of your years of experience, is there one bit of information that you would like to share with those listeners, regardless of the size of their organization, maybe regardless of where they're, whether they're in Texas or Chicago, Tampa, Florida, or Sacramento, California, one bit of advice that you think could help them as they prepare for this fall and next spring fundraising season? Ben, that's such a great point. First on imagination and opportunity. And thank you for stating that in that way. I think it's crucial. We say that about our littles. They might be born into circumstance, but that does not define them. And we love the opportunity to bring out the best in them. As I look as a fundraiser and think about all my peers out there, my best advice is choose one thing. We cannot boil the ocean, but boy, as fundraisers, we want to. I want to improve my digital strategy. I want to improve my individual donor process. I want to have a better sustainer program. I want to have a better corporate program. I'd like to get more foundation giving. How about we choose one and do it well, focus on it, give it its opportunity to flower, and then go plant some more seeds in your garden because you cannot... You cannot do them all at once and do them well, especially those of us that are one or two humans on the team. We also are still experiencing our own personal dynamics of balancing work and life at home and this new world. And we have to admit we cannot do it all every single day. So let's choose that one thing that we think is the most important to start or change or evolve within our portfolio and give that a moment And then, and then we'll start to see the sprout come out of the garden and then we can move to the next one. The list will never end, but we'll also never see change if we don't begin something. So let's find that one thing we can invest a little extra muscle and effort and brain power into and not leave it till Friday afternoon when when we're all too tired for it. Deb, you're such an inspiration. I love that because if you do one thing this week and one thing next week and by the end of the month, you know, you're at four things. So one at a time, do it well. And that was just such great, great advice. Such that an inspiration absolutely. to listen to you. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh, no, Don, part of, part of me. Uh, but it is, it is excellent leadership advice. Of all the great qualities that make a great leader, maybe one of the tops is focus. Uh, have a driving focus to achieve that goal. And by focusing on that one element of your fundraising allows you to be successful. Deb, thank you for sharing that. And we know that everyone listening who opens up their inbox for what someone calls the digital deluge, which is out there, your phone, your email, it's always blowing up as busy, hardworking individuals. But if you can allow yourself to focus, uh, you most certainly will succeed. So, Deb, thank you so very much. You know, fearless fundraisers, that's it. I mean, we are just about out of time for today. I want to thank you for listening. I certainly hope that you enjoyed today's Raise Nations uh, radio topic for your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. I certainly like to thank our sponsors, One Cause, for making this episode possible. And One Cause, of course, as you know, is driving the future of fundraising with easy to use software solution that help nonprofits connect with donors just as we've described here today. Be sure to check them out at onecause.com. And on behalf of my co-host, the legendary fundraiser herself, Don Lego, uh, I am Benjamin Farrell and a big, big shout out and thanks to our very special guest, Deb Barge, for sharing her tips, uh, her leadership advice, and all things that were exceptional for fundraising events. And so grateful to have you with us. If you're looking for more, of course, um, from Deb Barge, if you are listening to Raise Nation Radio, look her up on our app, the conference app. Connect with her and find out uh, how you can learn more. So until next time, uh, this is Benjamin Farrell, my amazing co-host, Don Lego, Deb Barge. This has been Raise Nation Radio. Stay fearless out there, everybody. 